what other people say. Where were you born and raised? I was born in London, but I was raised in Nigeria. I want to make it very clear. I mean, I was in Nigeria with my parents probably under the age of three years. So I, I was raised in Nigeria. When I came out as gay, I was rejected by my church denomination at the time. I was ostracized, so I couldn't go back there. So I stayed away for about two years. So towards the end of my second year of absence from church, I located a Pentecostal church that I fell in love with through television program and radio program. And I went along there in 1996. I stayed in this church community for about four years when they found out that I was gay and I was excommunicated again. So on this occasion, I was subjected to conversion therapy and laying our hands and healings and the abuse was uncanny. It really broke me apart, you know. I mean, I remember during that year of frustration, you know, I wrote a lot of poems. Sometimes the poems talk about my pain and so much more. But the reality for me is that I can run, but I cannot hide. I can suppress my sexual behavior, but I cannot erase my sexual orientation. Today, I celebrate my sexual orientation and identity. I celebrate everything about me. And, and I encourage others to do the same. If I'm in a space where I cannot be myself, I will not grow. My mental health will suffer. One. Thank you so much for having me in your home. I really do appreciate it. It means a lot to uh, finally meet you. Uh, I've heard so much about you. You are definitely one of a kind. A black African queer and a priest living in the UK. I think you have no competition whatsoever. So when people talk about the black African priest in the UK, automatically everyone knows it's you. Um, you've definitely ruffled a lot of feathers uh, on Twitter and you know globally. All these Nigerian blogs everywhere talk about you. So it's definitely an honor to finally get to meet you here in your home in Manchester. So thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Uche. It's really a pleasure to host you. Yes. And you're a great guest. So I've enjoyed uh, the hour since you've arrived. And uh, yes, I have ruffled so many feathers as a, a, a Black African British Nigerian, uh, a priest in the Church of England, an Anglican priest, and you know, also someone who's well educated in liberation and queer theology, and, and also a an human rights activist and also someone living with HIV for the past two decades. Mm -hmm. So um, my ministry is becomes quite profound in itself. And, um, you know, I at one point in my life, I always reject the idea that I'm a role model. But I've since embraced, you know, this that I'm a role model, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for many people. And for me, it is important because um, being in the place where I am, mm -hmm. you know, obviously by the grace of God, it means that there are so many people that can look up to me, you know, and be able to identify any of my intersectionalities. So even if you're black and a person living with HIV, if you're black and gay living with HIV, if you're African, if you're British, you know, there's something that you can identify with. And for that, I'm very grateful to God. Definitely. Yeah, so you're very interesting because you're a priest. You identify as a priest, right? Okay, and which is Christianity, right? Yes. Okay, you're very interesting in the sense that I know that reconciling LGBTQ queerness and Christianity is something a lot of people struggle with. And I know that even in my own little practice that I've had uh, for the past few years, I've had a lot of Nigerians reach out to me. Some of the things that they're struggling with is reconciling them both, you know, like how do you be African and queer and then Christian at the same time? And here you are, not just as a Christian, but also as a leader in the Christian faith and as also openly gay. How has that combination uh, been so far? I think the combination of reconciling faith and sexuality is really about the individual person developing a personal relationship with God and not with the institution. Mm -hmm. Now the institution church you know, has become extremely religious, you know, in terms of his governing. But if you look at the relationship with God, it's a personal relationship with God. And I've said too many times that there is nowhere in the Bible from Genesis through to Revelation that condemns homosexuality or same-sex relationship. But we had encounter with bad theology, misinterpretation of the scriptures, and of course, the obsessive culture uh, within some of the heteronormative uh, understanding of human sexuality. 
Now, of course, you know, um, we know that, you know, scriptures have been used to demonize, you know, black people and people of color. We know that, you know, scriptures have been used to subjugate women. We know that scriptures have been used to punish people with disability and they did punish children. So it's not always surprising, you know, to see that people are still trying to use scriptures to punish the LGBT community or members of the LGBT community. And I think that for me, my personal journey is I ask so many questions about my relationship with God. And, you know, I obviously came to a wonderful conclusion that for me being gay, for me means God adores you, God accepts you and God anoints you. And I'm not gonna sit down here and say that my journey has been any easier because of my own beliefs. Of course, you know, I've had to face, you know, the conflicts and with other people. But what is important is my consistency and you know my determination and my understanding of God's love for me, regardless of what other people's. Where were you born and raised? I was born in London, but I was raised in Nigeria. I want to make it very clear. I mean, I was in Nigeria with my parents probably under the age of three years. So um, I was raised in Nigeria. So I came back to live in England, you know, in my late teens and early twenties. So it meant that, you know, I have a good formation mm -hmm. and upbringing within the African culture. So mm -hmm. I'm very much African and very much Nigerian, like anyone that was born in that country. But I think that the grace that I have is the fact that I have the dual nationality and I've lived in England long enough, you know, to also understand the English culture. But I think that also plays a huge part in how I've come to understand my own journey of my faith and my sexuality because even growing up in London, I was very much immersed within the Nigerian community. When I first came out as gay, was within the Nigerian community in London. So I did experience the backlash of that. I was excommunicated from the very fake community that I, I was accustomed to. But the reality for me as a Nigerian is that I grew up in Nigeria. I understood the Nigerian culture. Um, I did experience or have some understanding of the objection of homosexuality as a young person in Nigeria. And the danger, you know, for many people that are growing up queer is that we don't have anyone, you know, to talk to that can provide the appropriate, culturally sensitive and traditionally appropriate pastoral care. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk to someone at the age of 15 about, I'm in love with John, you know, they're going to say demonic spirit. Whereas, you know, homosexuality has been around, you know, since creation. Mm -hmm. And um, we need a better understanding. We need a conducive environment within families and within the, the country and even in, in religious spaces so that LGBT people can grow up in safe environments. Where in Nigeria did you grow up? I grew up in Lagos. Lagos, okay. So it's relatively liberal compared to the rest of the country. I'm, the I'm, not sure, I'm not sure Lagos is entirely liberal. It all depends because yeah. now Lagos is being broken down into areas of, um, you know, um, a prosperous ease or elitism mm -hmm. and so on. But of course, you know, I mean, I grew up in the mainland, as they say, um, mm -hmm. you, you know, in a, in a town or maybe a city now called Ojoju. Mm -hmm. You know, Sammy, for those who know that area as compared to those who had lived in Victoria Island or the new islands across Lagos. But nonetheless, I think that, you know, the impact on human sexuality also depends on the knowledge of your families around sexuality. I grew up in a very Christian conservative home. Mm -hmm. My father is also a Christian minister and very conservative. Mm -hmm. And so again, that environment did suddenly prepare me for a better understanding of my own sexuality. The reason why I was asking, because I noticed that ministry is very important to you. And something that you mentioned earlier is one of the things that a lot of people struggle, a lot of uh, Nigerian queer Christians struggle with is lacking that pastoral guidance. And it seemed like that's something that's very personal to you. You know, like it seemed like you have a very strong affinity towards some type of ministry but then you didn't really see a whole lot of role models, people to confine in. Was that something that, that was an issue growing up? It was clearly an issue okay. because um, I came to full knowledge of my sexuality when I was 13 years old. So I've always known from when I was five years old, but you know, as the year progressed, it became more clearer you know, in my teens. But I think that you know, not having uh, a visible 
uh, role model or someone to look up to say, oh, okay, you know, I'm, you know, brother Jacob and brother John are queer lovers and, you know, I can go talk to them. I don't have any of those in my environment, let alone within the uh, faith space. But of course, you know, I mean, growing up in church and being part of a very Christian family, you know, the Bible is our watchword. So, you know, myself and my siblings, we read the Bible several times because we were very much involved in all the quizzes. And, you know, in my family, we come home with first, second and third prizes. It's like, you know, people think it's always a fix. You know, all these pastors' kids are always winning the prizes. But, you know, for me personally, you know, I was very much, um, you know, invested um, in my own personal growth, in my own Christian upbringing. So um, at age 13 was also when I discovered the very Bible text about homosexuality in Leviticus. So I read it over and over and it traumatized me as a young person, you know. So I, I struggled with my feelings and having read that text because I didn't understand it. Because, you know, as a 13 year old, reading the Bible that says, if a man has sex with another man, it's an abomination and they should be put to death. That is trauma for a young 13 year old Jide uh, at that time. But it took me a while, you know, to uh, overcome, you know, that understanding because Leviticus was not about condemning homosexuality. You know, it was a story of the Israelites, you know, as they were coming out of bondage. And how have you been able to rectify that passage? In order to rectify that passage, it's actually to put it into context of where it came from and why it came. Leviticus law was uh, called the holiness law you know, that is, you know, designated to the Israelites. They were coming out of um, bondage from Egypt where they've been for 400 years. They have been depleted, you know, as a people. So there were laws that actually prohibits, you know, um, certain kind of sexual relationship. And it wasn't just, you know, laws against same-sex sexual desires. It was also laws, you know, um, against um, adultery, fornication, young men having sexual relationships with their father's wives, and so on and so forth. So uh, the Leviticus law is called the Holiness Code. So there is so much about Leviticus that people do not understand. And you cannot use, you know, that one or two verses in Leviticus, you know, Sammy, to punish the entire millions of LGBT people around the world. It is, it is not compatible with Christianity. So going back to you not having that pastoral guidance, what triggered you to be that guidance for someone else? Well, I mean, the trigger to become a guidance to others was actually my own story because, um, you know, uh, having been raised in a very conservative Christian home, you know, I and also very African. This is the whole Nigerian of me. And I think for me it was important because I've learned that, you know, uh, you go to school, you get an education, then you have a wife and then you raise your own family. I followed that right mm -hmm. up to the T. And I think that for me, is a, I, there was also a time that I was struggling with my sexuality and I turned to God in prayer because this is what I've heard that we should do. We should pray earnestly to God, you know, to remove this burden, this, you know, homosexual spirit from us. And I did what Jesus did. When Jesus, after his baptism, he went to pray for 40 days and 40 nights. I did that as well. I said, if Jesus can do it to conquer the enemy, the devil, I can do the same too. I committed myself to pray and fast for 40 days. And then my prayer to God is to lift this spirit of homosexuality from me. And of course, at the end of 40 days, you know, there was a, a beautiful girl in my church you know, I turned to her and asked if she would be my girlfriend. And she said, yes. And in that moment, I was convinced that I've been cured of my same-sex attraction. And, you know, I kept on saying to myself, I, I, I'm not gay, I have got a girlfriend. And I'm sure that many people, you know, listening and watching me talk now, may be able to recognize them for themselves as well when they believe because you're in a relationship with the opposite sex, you know, does not mean that you have been cured of what is natural about you. I mean, following that, you know, I was in a relationship with this um, lovely, beautiful woman for seven years, including three years of marriage. And we have a child together. So, you know, our son is coming to his 31st, you know, birthday very soon. 
Now, of course, I mean, the, the, the reality for me is that, you know, I struggled throughout those seven years of the relationship. And, um, you know, my same sense of attraction never went away. You know, they were actually more pronounced. The only thing I felt is that I felt imprisoned. I felt trapped, you know, in a relationship with a woman. And I could not provide her with all the loving affections and attention that I believe that every heterosexual woman deserves. You know, they will not get it from a gay man. You know, my attention was very much drawn away from that relationship. And, you know, I always find every excuse to avoid uh, copulation or romance, you know, but I was not totally insensitive towards her presence. But I just knew that, you know, uh, my sexual orientation was certainly uh, entrapped in that moment. But having said that, in coming out, I was the one that sat with my ex-wife to tell her what was going on in my head, my body, and my soul. And of course, you know, uh, at first she didn't know what to do, neither did I know what to do. And again, that also goes back to the fact that there's no one to talk to. You know, um, I'm glad that I am here for people to come and talk to me if they're having all these challenges. And it is not uncommon in my ministry today that I have been able to mentor and provide pastoral care for both gay men and lesbian women who found themselves in heterosexual relationship. And um, yeah, I mean, several times I've asked them to break the relationship, you know, have a separation and divorce, but the important thing is, is to avoid the acrimony because no one got here, you know, by a perfect design. You know, you don't break your relationship with your opposite sex partner and then create acrimony around it. We have to find a way, you know, for a peaceful transition from that place to your wholeness. And, and that to me is very important. You know, a lot of people have accused me, so I do have a lot of enemies, you know, they've called me a uh, demonic, they've called me, you know, uh, an angel of hell, and they've called me doom pastor and all sorts of things. But I just know that speaking the truth in all righteousness for queer people is very, very important. So my transition from the heterosexual marriage was, when I came out as gay, I was rejected by my church denomination at the time. I was ostracized. So I couldn't go back there. So I stayed away for about two years. So towards the end of my second year of absence from church, I, you know, located a, a Pentecostal church that I have fallen in love with, you know, through television and program and radio program. And I went along there uh, in 1996. I stayed in this church community for about four years um, when they found out that I was gay and I was excommunicated again. So on this occasion, I was subjected to conversion therapy and laying our hands and healings and the abuse was uncanny. Um, it really broke me apart, you know. I mean, I remember during that year of frustration, you know, I wrote a lot of po poems, you know, sometimes the poems talk about my pain and so much more. But again, you know, I thought I found a church community where I can at least be myself. But I think that, you know, again, I, I believe that I entered into the church community you know, creating my own uh, fantasy about a safe space. So what I did going into the church was that I decided to keep my sexuality separate from the church. I wanted to go to church. I wanted to be part of a fellowship of praising God. And, and honestly speaking, I love the church community. I love the space, but I could not be myself 100%. And I get a lot of reactions when men say to me at church, oh, Jide, your hair looks really nice today and your shirt is well ironed or something like that. You know, it really gives me the creep because I think maybe they're making a pass of me. Um, and, you know, I don't know how to respond to things like that. But at the same time, unfortunately, there's a lot of homophobia as well. So you think about things like Father's Day, you know, it will be the day that somebody's going to talk about men should be men and fathers should be fathers and don't let your children not have fathers because they might become faggots in church. And that really makes me really uncomfortable. So there are times where there are homophobic rhetorics in church that makes me really, really uncomfortable. But the reality for me is that I can run, but I cannot hide. I can suppress my sexual behavior, but I cannot erase my sexual orientation. Today, I celebrate my sexual orientation and identity. I celebrate everything about me. And, and I encourage others to do the same. It's not always easy because I'm always mindful that even for those who live in England or even in America, 
sometimes you know our communities are still very precious to us mentoring someone who said to me today please don't ask me not to go to my local nigerian church because they wear my clothes they eat my food and they dance to my music my sexuality is just a small part of me but we forget that it's a huge part of us it, it impacts many things in our lives and it's really in a space where i cannot be myself i will not grow my mental health will suffer and subsequently physical yeah how old were you when you came out um when i came out i was Probably about 28 years, 27, 28 years old. I met my ex-wife when I was probably about 20 or 21 years old. We were together for about seven years. So how did your ex-wife take the news of you coming out? Coming out to my ex-wife was difficult. It was difficult for me and it was difficult for her as well. I think initially we were going to work on what do we do and what do we say. But I think that you know, about three months or so after I came out to her, she started to process this with her family and our relationship became very acrimonious. And that didn't help at all because she was angry. Then I got angry. There are things that I do that I'm not proud of. But of course, when you're angry, you know, you do do crazy things. Sorry. That's fine. I'm sorry. When I talk about my relationship with my ex-wife, it's always a very painful thing for me to recount because one of the things I know very well is that I did love my ex-wife. I was in love with my ex-wife, but it wasn't enough because my sexual orientation was very different. So I could not fulfill the whole heterosexual relationship in that sense. And I'm always very mindful because there are so many queer men who are going into relationship with women when they shouldn't. And I know that people say to me, you know, my family are getting me a wife, they're forcing me to get married, you know, and I have to follow this. And it's just creating that web of the seeds that goes on. And unfortunately for many people as well, they're unable to separate themselves from this whole heteronormative idea because of inheritance, because of culture, because of even what they believe the Bible says. And I think that this is, again, you know, we come back to the Bible over and over. The criteria for heaven does not include heterosexual marriage. You understand know I me? Mean? It just requires that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and you love your neighbor as yourself. And that's, we don't see much of that in the world that we live in today. So I would say to any queer person, you know, thinking of entering into a heterosexual relationship, don't don't it's different for bisexual men and bisexual women because they can navigate that journey but if you are same gender loving my strongest pastoral advice is don't god loves you nonetheless you need to love yourself enough not to put yourself through that i didn't have the pastoral care that i'm providing today and i wish that i did i wish there was someone i can go to to have this conversation with, and then they can give me the best mentoring and the best advice and pray with me and set me on the right path. I'm hoping that many people will hear this and not make the mistake that I made. It's very costly. I mean, my ex-wife don't talk to me today. I don't have the best of relationship with my own child as well. And these are consequences. Everyone gets hurt. If I never married her, then this wouldn't have happened in the first place. Do you mind sharing your relationship with your family or lack of? My, my family is very, very, very different. When it comes to the issue about my sexuality, I think it's something that my family also found very difficult to deal with. My older brother passed away in 2018. May so rest in peace. I remember a few years, you know, before he passed away, we were talking about my sexuality. And he said to me that, you know, they've always loved me, but they didn't know how to approach the matter. They didn't know how to address this. So when I came out as gay, I lost my very close bond relationship with my siblings. In fact, because we didn't talk about it, we drifted apart. And the more we drifted apart, the distance became wider and wider. So when queer people are coming out in any community in any race we need to begin to find how do we support other members of the family because my siblings would not have drifted away from me if i knew or they knew how to support someone coming out as gay in their family and of course you know there are different members of my family that handled my sexuality differently when i came out to my mother my mother's also late as well she passed away in 2013 
may her soul rest in peace. When I came out to my mom, I came out to my mom three years after my separation and divorce from my ex-wife. My mother was just saying, why did I not tell her that I was gay? I mean, she made a, a cracking joke like, oh, for three years, she's been praying that I find another wife. Instead, she would have been praying for a husband. I almost choked, you know, on my chicken noodles that day. It's like, mom, what are you talking about? But I mean, obviously, in my mother's wisdom, she was not much of a, a very visible activist. It was what she did in her lifetime for me that makes me completely believe that she loved me regardless of everything. There was a time that my mother asked me to run an errand for her and I avoided her. And I made a statement that, look, mom, please stop disturbing me. I'm not your only child. She actually scolded me and said, I know how many children that I've got. And when I ask you to do things for me, it's because I want you to do it for me. And beyond that, when I took House of Rainbow to Nigeria, my mother visited Nigeria and she participated in the congregation in Nigeria. She also supported, you know, a lot of House of Rainbow members who are, you know, LGBT. She visited some of their parents and encouraged some of those parents to accept their children. She did this on her own. I did not ask her. I didn't encourage her. She did this on her own. Of course, in England, where she lived before she passed away, she became a mother to a lot of my queer friends and they exchanged gifts. I know a gay friend of mine that bought my mom a whole sewing machine. Uh, you know, several bought, you know, we would come to my mother's house and celebrate her birthday. She would celebrate our birthday in her home. And one of my friends who lost his mom, my mom actually said, I will be mom to you. You know, so again, I, I don't know what more allyship looks like, especially from a parent. But unfortunately for my, for my dad, my dad found out my sexuality probably about six years after my divorce and separation from my ex-wife. And that's the time that I came out. My father scolded me. My father spoke to me heavily in words that were condemning. Um, my father was more interested in his own reputation in Nigeria. My father was more concerned about his own status in the country as opposed to my own well-being. And of course, you know, when I moved to Nigeria to start House of Rainbow, you know, in 2006, and throughout my stay in Nigeria, my father refused to visit me at, in my home in Nigeria. He said to me, I cannot come to the house of the homosexual. I said, you know, you're not coming to the house of the homosexual, you're coming to the house of your child. And what really hurts me is that my aunt lived about a block or two away from where I live. My father will visit her and he will not visit me. And that hurts. That really, really hurts. And, and needless to say, I also found out that my dad was very much in relationship with the Nigerian government in the development and the implementation of the anti-gay bill in Nigeria. If your father is sleeping with the enemy that are making laws that will put you behind bars for 14 years, when the bill became law, my father celebrated this in Nigerian media, congratulating the Nigerian government, and then said things like, well, if my son went to jail, maybe he will come to his senses. My father recommended shock therapy and conversion therapy to cure his son of homosexuality. I have got nothing to do with it. If my understanding of God is right, that God knew me before I was formed in my mother's womb, I believe that as a gay man, as a gay child, I was a precious gift from God that was given to my parents. My mother knew what to do with the gift, but my father did not. And that to me is a big shame. And needless to say, there are so many things that's also happened. I don't take too much of these things to heart because I've got a life to live. I've got a ministry to uphold. So I pray for everybody. So the way that I've dealt with my relationship with my family is live and let live. So I've kind of like kept a good distance. I love my family members unconditionally, but I just know that the mental and emotional anxiety in dealing with issues around my sexuality is not worth it. So let everyone stay in their space. I just love from afar. I love them from afar. There has been some key family events that has brought us into the same space. I love them nonetheless. And at the end of the day, it's goodbye. But if they reach out to me, then I will embrace that. I've always said to my close friends that I love attention and that attention is when I'm visible and I'm loved and I'm not hated upon or 
I'm not thrown away into the distance. It's an attention around my own needs and welfare. I don't, I'm not seeking for attention in terms of publicity and fame. No, there's a personal attention that it really helps that I, we love you and we care for you kind of attention. Mm. That was deep. Okay. Oof. Compared to when you were still in a closet, how has life been now that you're out of the closet? I mean, it's been several years now. Um, how would you say it compared to that before and after? I mean, the times that I was in the closet was very difficult. But when I came out of the closet, it is still difficult because you have to deal with different kind of people or even different kind of mindset. When I was in the closet, I had queer friends. And even when I was married, I had queer friends. Being in the closet, I it was difficult for me to publicly or openly socialize with queer people. So it became the secret. And that is why it's called the closet. I think I would have been the category of men living on the down low was in the closet. But coming out, oh my God, coming out is like celebrating. It's like burning down the closet and blowing the ashes away. I mean, the metaphor, the metaphor of freedom that I can fly, you know, I'm an elephant, but I've got wings and I can fly with all of my weight. And, um, and I think that coming out is things that I have to do every day for the rest of my life. Because when I make new friends, when I come into a new community of people, I have to come out. And, you know, with all my intersectionalities, I have to come out. The one thing I don't have to come out is being Black. Because I hope to everybody that is obvious. But I still have to come out as African. I still have to come out that I'm British. I mean, I was having a conversation with someone quite recently, and they were asking me, so, Jide, how did you process your uh, asylum in the UK? And I had to breathe in that, oh, my God, I've got to come out. That I'm not, I was not a person that was, had to seek asylum in England because I was born here. And to be quite honest, you know, I kind of celebrate that moment because it was good that they thought that I was a person who had to seek asylum. And that is a testament of the work that I'm doing within that community. Now to come out, you know, with my HIV status of which I celebrate every single day. I say, I thank God for my HIV status because I'm living well with it. But people want to demonize me by saying that, well, you, you got HIV because you're a or something like that. I think you might have to censor that bit, you know, <laughs> but because you're homosexual. And I think sometimes, you know, coming out afterwards, I celebrate it a lot. I celebrate the fact that I'm a Christian, that I believe in God, that I believe in Jesus Christ. And I celebrate that now. And this is something that I could not do once I was in the closet. I was so afraid. I was so afraid. And a quick example of my fear was when I went to the Pentecostal church where I was for four years. I went there. I kept my gay self outside of the church. I took my Christian self into the church. The two were fighting each other. Now I had gay friends that I spent time with. They come to my home. Then when my Christian friends are coming, I have to dig in my house. It was painful. I have to remember what stories did I tell the gays and what stories did I tell the Christians? When I go to the nightclubs and the bars with the gay guys, I have to leave early because I've got church in the morning. You see the, the challenge is there. But the, the moment I was able to reconcile the two, it was freedom. But I lost friends on both sides. Ridiculous. Because, yes, because my gay friends felt that, you know, GD has come to be with the Christian abusers. And the Christians believe that I've been corrupt because I'm a homosexual. But I just know to God, this is my wholesome that I'm able to bring the two together. And this is the message that I want to take out to the world to the death of the world. I want to say to Black Africans and Black people in the diaspora who are LGBT, and if you have families who are LGBT persons, love them because Christ loved them unconditionally. There's nothing we can do. We've got so much hatred that's even coming out of the church, that's coming out of religious leaders' mouths, that is just so ungodly. If there's any message at all, it's the message that God loves you just the way you are. Without an apology. What message do you have to every queer person out there who is still struggling with their sexuality and in the closet? A message for any queer person out there, because 
The reality for queerness is that it's in our DNA. We always know this from when we were young. And I started a theory that I want people to practice. So say, let's say, for example, you're 30 years old. Think about two things between the age of zero and 10 that connect you to your queerness. I remember when I was nine years old, my grandmother clenched her fist and punched me in the chest. I said, stand like a boy, no grandchild of mine will be a sissy. Of course, my grandmother was a Jehovah's Witness, and I know that she probably recognized my sexuality and she wasn't having any of that. Now, between the age of 10 and 20 is the second decade. At 14 years old, I had a boyfriend, but I didn't think he knew he was my boyfriend. So I was living my life. My sexuality was already there. You understand me? So, of course, you know, in my late teens, I was struggling with my sexuality. Between the age of 20 and 30, I have been in a relationship with the opposite sex, you know, that I've talked about. So our sexuality is formed, is pronounced throughout our lives. I'm telling young people to understand their sexuality is really to live their own truth and also find people around them that they can talk to. It's getting easier today because we've also got social media. We've got lots of, you know, organizations like House of Rainbow. We've got people like myself, you know, not just me. I mean, there are many others, especially in the US and in Europe, you know, that are, that are there that people can connect with. But it is so important that families as well also create a safer environment. So if you're an uncle or an auntie or a parent who understands human sexuality, especially LGBT, make it known to people around you, especially the young ones uh, around you. There will be one or two that will come to you and thank you for being open and vocal and being a safe space for them. And of course, for everyone else, it is important that you know for yourself who you are and be able to connect with those who love you and those who care for you. Thank you.